I had my first husband who died in Saudi Arabia. We went to Saudi Arabia in 1984. And you know, it's really God's timing to, you know, it's in his time that you will be saved. So when I went to Saudi Arabia in 1984, I met again my colleague, you know, in, in the same city in Al Kobar, Saudi Arabia. So we, we, we met again there and then he was, you know, he started a ministry in Saudi Arabia. And he invited me and he invited us. And then we, we, we you know, since Saudi Arabia is nothing during that time, you know, uh, I can't really work. I was there just because we, we were um, um, a couple. But we attended the, that Bible study and it started. But then uh, it was just a vacation for me for three months and then I went back to the Philippines. And then uh, finally, I settled there in 1985. So that was the time that I really, you know, had a deep, deeper relationship with God. We had an underground ministry in Saudi Arabia. Amen. So um, there was a time when we, when we um, attended this fellowship, we were caught by a police, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they call it Mutawa in Saudi Arabia. We were caught by a police and... Um, they arrested us, me and my husband arrested us, and um, they, talk question, they, they asked questions, and we just told them, no, we were just attending a party. <laughs> because when they heard party, they will not, they will not bother you to, to ask more questions, so they released us. Mm. And then that time, since it was very dangerous to, you know, to continue attending this church, which is an underground ministry, so our... our our team uh, decided to have our ministry in our apartment. So we had that, that underground ministry in our main apartment, which we were living just beside a, a police department <laughs> office, you know. <laughs> but it, it didn't stop us to continue our ministry. And uh, that was the time that I really, you know, surrendered my life to Jesus. And we went to some, we call it barracks, where those construction workers, um, not only Filipinos, but there were some, you know, uh, Muslims, so to speak, um, Lebanese, you know, uh, other other cultures. So for me, um, we, we we should not stop, you know. Um, Amen. So th that's that's how I came to to know about Jesus. So yeah, it's just, uh, I just love that story. You know, here she is. She's Filipino. Has to go to Saudi Arabia to find Jesus in a completely closed, closed culture and uh, finds Christ and then begins living her faith out there. Jim was born in Japan and by her, his parents were Southern Baptist missionaries and uh, came to Christ there. I've read his testimony. I, really what I wanted to ask him was because one of the things that we find out with people who um, grow up in another culture is how do you acclimate coming back and, you know, because there, it's a very strong minority Christians are. Uh, Japan has not widely opened up, if I'm understanding, to faith. There's, God's doing stuff, but, uh, and then how you connect, because you grew up in that culture, and, and uh, how's that, how that connect to being back here in the States? Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you talk about how it's, they're not fully opened in Japan. <laughs> Legally, they are. The Japanese people um, have full opportunity to come to faith in Japan. However, only less than a half a percent of the population has come to know Christ because of the persecution in the past. And so it is different. One of the things that I think I had been blessed with when I came back to the States um, was my involvement in my college. Now, up until I was 18 years old, there was only one church in the world, and that was the Southern Baptist Church. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just going to be real with you, you know, <laughs> that, that's kind of how I felt. Um, I had the opportunity to go to a non-denominational Christian college in Northeast Texas called Laterno University. And during my, my uh, four years in college, I had an opportunity to, to be in an environment where the majority of the students there were also missionary kids or involved in the mission field in one way or another. And I got to go to different churches. I got to go to Pentecostal churches. I got to go to Bible churches. I got to go to... Uh, very, um, very charismatic black churches uh, that are very exciting. I mean, they're, to say the least. Um, but that was a choice that I made. One of the, the concerns, I think, that 
I see coming out of kids growing up in the mission field is that sometimes I feel like they're often forgotten. Mm -hmm. there, I can't tell you how many missionary kids that I know today that are just as lost as any other person that you'd see in the community around you that continue to need your prayers. Um, they, they look at their upbringing as, as a burden because they were confined to this value of life that, that was their parents' faith. It wasn't their own faith. And so uh, I feel fortunate that at a young age I came to know Christ. Um, while I was in Japan, there was a, a guy from North Carolina. I think you all might have heard of him. His name, in Japanese, it was Billy Gramu. <laughs> uh, and uh, he came over and uh, I got to go to one of his uh, conferences in like second grade and that was phenomenal. But um, yeah, it's not easy to assimilate, especially when your parents drop you off at college. And my dad looked at me when I was 18 and he said, son, I love you, bye. <laughs> Dropped me off at college and he went back to Japan. <laughs> um, I did have an opportunity at that, that first Sunday that I was in college and I remember the, that to this day. I was sitting there on that first Sunday and I was like, wow, my parents aren't telling me where to go. My parents aren't telling me to go to church. They're not telling me to stay home. But that day, I made the decision, I'm going to go to church. I looked in the phone book, and I started calling churches that would come pick me up and give me a ride. And uh, it has been real faithful since then. And so not to say I've had a perfect life. I mean, all that y'all that know me know that a lot of my struggles have come as an adult. And, uh, but that's through my own fault. God's been faithful. God's been pure. God's been awesome. And uh, he has never forgotten me, no matter how much I've been disobedient to him. Amen. There we go. That's great. Yeah. Amen. And he brings up a great point because if you look at these pictures up here, these are families. They're not, well, some of them are just individuals because we have some single missionaries, but they're families. They have children. And there is some real issues with children and missionaries. They have struggled because they're moving not only cross culturally, but they've been in a very insulated environment. And we want to pray that God would just um, speak to the kids. Now, we're being, I do appreciate this about the Assemblies of God. They are very proactive with missionary kids. They do a lot to help these kids um, uh, to assimilate. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, my friends who, uh, just like my, uh, Mike and Naomi Lawrence that were here last week, uh, their son married a, a Colombian girl. And he is fully ingrained in the Colombian in another. They have their children are more Palestinian than they are American. And uh, you say, well, how they're Christians, but they're Palestinian. They they even sound like them. <laughs> and uh, it's a, it's an interesting environment that they 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 are created. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Jim. Edna grew up in church. Yes. Mm. Yes. Um, I was born and raised in church. Um. My uh, parents uh, had a lot of faith, and at home it wasn't like a choice. Like, if you want to go to church or if you want to stay home, you got to go to church. <laughs> it was like go to school and go to church, go to school, go to church. And um, my parents want, wanted us to be involved in all the activities, go to choir, practice, youth uh, uh, meetings, and everything and but it was for me a process it was for me a process to see um how god works in my life and in my environment like in pa my parents life and i was like looking to see okay what's gonna happen it's like every day or every occasion okay something you're looking to see something gonna happen and i remember my mom used to every sunday she used to set apart some food and say, okay, God's going to send somebody to eat that food. And we're like, okay, let's see what's going to happen. And somebody came. <laughs> we're like, it happened almost every Sunday. Sometimes it you know, did not happen, but it was like, okay. And that was it. And God talked to me and transformed my life. And, and I'm in, no matter what. That's right. Uh, she... She grew up in an Assembly of God church yes. in uh, Haiti. That's the planting of an AG missionary. Yes. 
So somebody sowed some seeds, and Edna's here. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Malachi's really glad. <laughs> and uh, we are so thrilled that uh, they are a part of our church family. We have a direct and deep connection uh, with Haiti uh, because of uh, people that have been a part of our church. And I just wanted you to get a vision. They have a unique perspective. They didn't grow up here. They, didn't, they weren't a part of this culture. But they are the products of the idea of missions. Just like the friend who said, I don't care where I go, I'm going to be Jesus' representative. And the only reason why we have this, these beautiful Filipino families here, somebody believed it was important enough to tell Lagaya that Jesus mattered. And she became an influencer among people in a country that's completely closed. And what an amazing thing. We're thrilled to have them here with us. All their stories are important stories. And it plays into what I want to just share for a few moments. They were willing to uh, come up here and <laughs> do what's not very comfortable um, so that you could get a vision. And as we're wrapping up our month of missions, we're not finished with missions. Missions is who we are. We've been emphasizing it here, but missions is who we are. And, 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 and as I was, I'm just going to share for a couple minutes, and then we're going to ask you to, to join with us in how we can contribute and be a part of missions on an ongoing basis. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, the, ch the 11th chapter, the writer goes through this amazing uh, litany of telling the story of people who lived and walked by faith. And he goes down and it's amazing as you walk your way through it. Uh, if you get a chance, read the whole chapter, 11th chapter of Hebrews. And he comes to the end uh, as he's looked and, lo and he's talked about these people whose lives have changed the course of history because of their faith. And, and so he comes down to the end and he's... Uh, kind of wrapping this up, and he says in the last two verses, they weren't verses or chapters back then, but as he kind of finishes this part of his letter he's writing to the, to, to the Hebrews, he's, he's writing and he says this in chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, in the NIV it says this, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them had received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. I want to repeat that again, verse 40. So that only together with us they, would they be made perfect. In the message uh, version of this, it says this, not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. God had a better plan for us that their faith and our faith would come together to make one completed whole. Their lives not completed apart from ours. Notice that. Their faith and our faith, one completed whole. Now why am I drawing upon this? Because that's what missions is really all about. That without us recognizing that we are a part of a bigger picture, that we are a part of something bigger than us, that only as we together will it actually paint the picture of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ for people no matter where they live. And that's what I want us to see today. That's what I wanted you to see. You know, we live in, in an amazing time. This is an amazing environment we here, have here at Southside. I have never in my life been a part of a group of people that had such a diverse uh, background and cultural framework. We literally have people from all over the world, every social and economic status, every uh, racial framework, we have them all here at this church. In this small group of people, we have representatives literally from around the world. That's, yay. By the way, you better get used to it. That's what heaven's going to look like. That's what it's going to be in heaven. Uh, there will be no neighborhoods in heaven. It's 
Some of y'all, what do you mean? There won't be a Haitian neighborhood. There won't be a Ghana neighborhood or a Japanese neighborhood. There'll just be heaven. You know? You say, well, I don't know if I can live next to those folks. You're not going to make it. <laughs> just, just saying it the way it is. <laughs> The story and the reality of Jesus would only be realized in people's lives if we act together. We can't do this by ourselves. These people that we've got pictures of or her or her pictures are on that wall back there, they can't do it by themselves. It's only as we act together. So I, I have just a few moments here. I want to share three quick thoughts with you. Really quickly, I want to share them with you because I believe God wants to do a miracle today. I believe that with all my heart. So here's the first one. There is no separation between the going and the giving. Yeah, I grew up with, hey, you know, they're going, we're giving, that's our role. And that's not the way it works. That's not what God intended, nor did he mean that. Jesus himself, when he left his disciples, he didn't say, well, some of you are going to be givers and some of you are going to be goers. That's not what he said to him. He said, here's what he said to him, very simply. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The idea, if I give a few dollars to missions, I've done my job, misses the beauty, the wonder of a life lived in faith. We're all goers and we're all givers. Let me say that again. We're all goers and we're all givers. Whether we go and, and just like yesterday, thank you for so many of you showing up and, and just walking to Bed Avenue, praying and picking up trash and, and interceding for, that's a goer. Or just as we've been, you know, the uniqueness of having Nick on the police department. He's a goer. All these things that we're doing, we're representing, we're going. You have an environment that God's called you to be a goer into. Every one of us is, is a goer. And every one of us is a giver. Some of y'all want, what? Now you got messed me up here. And here's the wonderful thing. All these people, these pictures that are here, they were givers before they were goers. And they're still givers today. Not this year, but the year previous, a council, one of our missionaries' wife had uh, developed cancer, needed to get home, and she didn't have funds. They didn't have funds to get her home. Uh, and so in council, they... Um, they uh, wanted to raise the money. And a young missionary, <laughs> a young missionary candidate, said, I'll pay. I'll pay. He needed money, but he understood something. This is how this works. Only together, only together can we get this thing done. Only together can the mandate of Christ happen in our world as we come to tell the beautiful story of Jesus Christ and what he's done for mankind. Only together, he understood as clear as clear can be, he may be a goer, but he's also a giver. And we will never lose that component in our life. We're both goers and we're both givers we have to walk in both realms there's no separation of that they're not the goers and we're not the givers they are givers and goers and we are goers and givers my second point i told you i was going to be quick here my second point is the story can only be written if people's in people's lives if we act together that's what the writer of Hebrews was saying. Their faith and our faith make one complete whole. Their faith and our faith make one complete whole. The story of Jesus can never be told by one person alone. It takes all of us telling the story. Whether it's in our sharing in the environment that we are particularly planted in. One of the things that you have that I do not have, you have a circle of influence I may never go to. 
I may never intersect with the people that you intersect with on a day-to-day basis. I may never encounter them. There is a high likelihood I will never meet all the parents that, that Nancy and Robert and their team will meet. I will never have the opportunity to hold those babies. Maybe I will. I hope so. But it, here's the deal. I am partnering with them to do that ministry. I am partnering with these people on this table. And they are partnering with me so that I can go into the places that you can't go. And I can share Jesus where you can't do it. We are all together. We, it requires all of us together for the job to get done. No man, it, it, it takes all of us. And you say, well, I'm not, I don't have any, yeah, I, don't, I can't do that. No, that's not true. It is absolutely not true. We had a wonderful missionary with us last night. His name is Joe Terramontosi, and he, he's just an amazing guy. I love Joe. He's, he's great. He and his wife, they have a special needs child. Uh, and out of that has come, they are part of a ministry to special needs people. They do. They do amazing things. They do these camps, uh, getaways, for special needs. The largest unreached people group in the United States is special needs kids, people. The largest unreached people group in the United States who've never had an adequate present, presentation of the gospel is special needs. Because, you know, people just don't think they need it. But I wish you could meet them. <laughs> you understand that, Valerie, don't you? You understand that. Here's the deal. They are, they are seeing thousands of people come to Christ who other people would have ignored and left behind. We have a sensitivity here. We've had so many folks come through that were special needs. And God does amazing miracles in them. And you know what I found is? Those people, we wouldn't think they had any role in the kingdom. But they are incredible influencers for the kingdom. See, it's only together. Only together. We can't act independently. And we sure need one another. To get the job done. My third point. Is faith is the energy. And the motivation. That moves us together. To get the job done. Faith is the energy and the motivation. There are three statements. And I. These are critical statements. And if we don't connect with any one of these statements, none of this will happen. The first is, the first statement is very simply this. We have to believe that the story is important. We have to believe that the story is important. If you don't believe that what Jesus Christ did and what he can do in other people's lives is the most important thing that's ever been done and could be told about, we're in trouble. We are in trouble because that has to be number one thing. It's the baseline of all other things. We have to believe that the story is important. Listen, I have been given this wonderful story about a God who loved me enough to say, I'm not going to let you die. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to rescue you from yourself. I'm going to intervene in your life. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to send my son to take your place, to pay the price for your sins, your death, your mistakes, your struggles. I'm going to send him to do that so that upon you putting your faith in him, you can experience new life and live forever with me. That's a good story. And it's not a make-believe story, it's a reality. I've experienced it in my life. And here's the thing, everything else is secondary. And if I don't believe that, I'll never partner to get the job done. And that's an honest question we need to ask ourselves. What's the most important thing in our life? 
I have to ask myself sometimes. How do you know you, stuff that kind of looks good can you become more important than the important stuff? You know, ministry, you can make ministry more important than the story. And you can do all this stuff, but that's not the important thing. The only reason we have a building isn't so we can have a building. It's so somebody can know that Jesus Christ died for them. So if I'm all consumed with the building and don't tell the story, I've missed it. And anything we do, and listen, guys, man, I get excited about stuff. It's college football season. Some of y'all don't even care. It's okay. The rest of us, Georgia won yesterday. Yes, they did. Uh, pray for all the people in Tennessee. They are in severe war- mourning, very deep, profound mourning. You know, it's, 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 it's a tough time, you know, for them. But, uh, I, you know, I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever your world is, you know, you get excited about. I don't care. That's great. I'm not against that. It's great, but here's the deal. That will all pass away, but one thing will remain, that you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and He, He will save you from yourself, your sin, and your sorrows, and He will make a way for you to live forever. That's a good story. That has to be the most important one. So number one, we have to, We have to believe that the story is important. Number two, we have to believe that it needs to be told. We have to believe that. Paul said, I am determined to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, this is the deal, guys. The one thing I need to do is i got to tell the story. And, And, you know... That has to be the reality of our life. We have to believe that the story is important, and we have to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that it needs to be told. That somehow in our life, through how we live and talk and and move and share, that we tell the story. Now, here's the deal. We tell the story in the context of what it means to us. I tell what God has done for me, how he has changed my life, how he's made a difference in my life, how he has done amazing things in my life. Did you hear today, has these shared what Jesus had done for them? And if you heard Legaya, she just said, listen, I finally, you know, whatever it was, God's timing worked, and I said, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. And the most immediate thing that happened in her life, she started telling others. And I want to just challenge us. If it's a great story, shouldn't it be told? It's the best story. It's the most amazing story. It's the reason why Paul, if you ever met him, he would say this. Hey, Jada. My name's Paul. How you doing? I was on the road to Damascus. (laughs) I was on the road to Damascus. What was he saying? I'm going to tell you the story and what it means to me. That's how we do it. Please don't go out there and beat people up with four spiritual laws and tell them they're all going to hell. It may be true. but it will probably get you punched. (laughs) Or some of our kids went to Starbucks and they were trying to be nice and they were going to buy coffee and the first one that went up to to buy coffee for somebody, the guy turned around and basically cussed them out. Welcome to the gospel. (laughs) I've been cussed out by professionals. I mean... Um, I have a dear friend, my first encounter with him, on the phone. The first words he said to me, he explained to me where I could go and exactly how I could get there. In words that I cannot share. Don't let that be the end of the story. 
I led him to Christ at his coffee table in his living room. Because you see, the story's not finished till the story's finished. And there's always an opportunity. The story needs to be told. The last thing is, we have to believe. We have to believe that God will provide for the telling. Why would somebody leave everything that's familiar, their family and friends and culture, to go literally around the world to tell the story? One, they believe it's a story worth telling. And two, they believe that it needs to be told. And three, they believe that God will make a way for it to be told. Why would I say, Lord, how would you like for me to partner with those who are telling the story? One of the things I wanted to do as we came to the faith promise part of our month of missions I wanted to move the money component out of it. Because when you start talking about money, people get weird. Have you ever noticed that? I've watched some of you in your giving. You, you, now back before we had all this electronic stuff, you'd pull your checkbook out and you would go to write a check and it looked like somebody had just pulled several teeth out of your head. That's because we get caught up in the money of it. But here's the thing. That's not what this is all about. The money is only a mechanism. It's the faith. Because we believe the story needs to be told. And what we're saying is, God, I believe you have the means to get the story out there. And some of that means, I believe you want to run through me. It's not about the money. It's about the faith. It's about connecting that we're not just giving, but we're partnering with people that we, as we are doers in our life, are givers to them as they are doers in their life because they've been giving to us as an example and sharing with that themselves. We're partnering together. What we're saying is only together. Only together. Can the story be told? And we believe that God has the means to do it. About a year and a half ago or so, we here at Southside, our leadership team, recognized that we weren't where we needed to be, financially or any other way. And we made a conscious decision that if God was the means and source of supply, then we could trust him. So what we did was we started saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? And out of that, we decided that the Lord had spoken to us in times past, that out of every do dollar that came into this church, uh, in general fund money, 10 cents of it immediately would go out. One-tenth of everything that we bring in would go out and be planted into helping people get the story out there. That's above, uh, beyond what you give. That's what the church is committed to do. That's us. And you know what God did? He met our financial needs. And, and Gene is probably in the nursery today. Uh, I think he's in the nursery today. But if you were to ask him, you see, there a couple of years ago, we were kind of wondering how we were going to pay the next bill. And I can tell you today, we have somewhere between thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in our checking account and thirty dollars or $40,000 in our savings account. How did that happen? We believe God has the means to tell the story. How did that happen? Well, all things that you wouldn't think. We were able to refinance. How did that happen? God opened a door. 
that had, we couldn't go through. We, we tried. What I want to say is, all this is, it's, it's not, you know, you got, oh man, I can't afford to do that. Let me tell you something. You can't afford not to do it. It's about saying, I believe, God, you got the means. And what do you want to run through my life so I can partner with those who are going? And so in my doing, I can add to it my giving so that more people can hear the good news that Jesus Christ could be their Savior. That's all it's out. I don't want to, it's not, the money isn't the problem, isn't the issue. Here's the deal. I know that if some of you would honestly pray, God will lay upon your heart a number that's going to scare you to death. Well, not to death. That's, we don't want that to happen. It's going to scare you considerably. And here's the deal. If God put that number on your heart, it's not up to you. It's up to Him. Now, you've got to obey But it's not up to you because we have to believe God has the means for the story to be told. What we want to do, and this is what I'm excited about, I want to multiply how we're partnering with people to get the story out. I want Joe Taramantosi to be able to reach more handicapped people to meet special needs people. He's going to Brazil tomorrow to, to begin this ministry in Brazil. I want to help him get that job done because I believe it's something that can be done. I want to help people on our college campuses. I want to help people who are entering into areas of this world. I want to partner with the Live Dead movement where we're seeing people go into places that the gospel's not supposed to go because I believe this. Jesus wants the gospel preached in Saudi Arabia. He wants the gospel preached in Syria. He wants the gospel preached in every closed environment that there is because he loves those people. And I want a partner. I want to go and I want to give.